Thank you for joining us today. I'm Stephen Fantone, a 1979 PhD optics graduate from the Hagem School and the parent of two master's graduates from the Institute of Optics. We have a wide range of registrants joining us for this session, including students, faculty, parents, alumni, and many friends. Many of you I recognize from my former role as co-chair of the Boston Network Leadership Cabinet, the Boston Area Alumni Group. I also serve as chair of the Hagem Dean's Advisory Committee, which is a group of alums and friends of the university that provide feedback and advice to the dean. I was on campus just a few weeks ago when I was delighted to see an energized student body, their joy of being on campus, interacting in person with friends and colleagues was palpable, as was the enthusiasm of faculty in being able to teach in person again. As Wendy presents to you today, I think you'll see how excited she is about life on campus in the academic year ahead. Thank you again for joining us, and I'll turn it over now to Dean Heinzelman. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to share my screen. Try that again. Okay, hopefully you can all see this now. Um, wanted to say, first of all, thank you, Steve, for the nice uh, introduction and for being here to um, uh, help introduce the session today. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for coming and hearing about all we have going on at the Hagem School. So let me start by following up on something that Steve said in his introduction and just say how excited we are to be back on campus this semester. We have in-person classes, we have events that are going on. Our campus is alive with activity. Uh, student organizations are once again hosting events and connecting students. Faculty and staff are enjoying teaching students in the classroom and engaging with students, uh, both in person and virtually. And we even got to enjoy a fantastic commencement celebration for the class of 2020 on a beautiful fall weekend in Rochester. So we are taking what we learned during COVID and seeing how best to adapt this to our residential campus. For instance, our advisors are offering both in-person and virtual advising sessions. Our department colloquia speakers, the different speakers who come in to talk to our departments, they're coming a mix of in-person as well as virtual this year. And some of our faculty and TAs are offering in-person and virtual office hours. We are experimenting and learning as we go, but it is so nice to have choices and options this year. We've had some changes in the Hagem Dean's office that I wanna highlight for all of you. During 26 years of outstanding service as our assistant dean of undergraduate studies, no one has worked harder or more successfully than Lisa Norwood to foster diversity at the Hagem School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Lisa has been instrumental in creating pathways for underrepresented, low-income, and first-generation students to excel in engineering. She has also been an inspiring mentor to countless students an innovative administrator and an enthusiastic ambassador for our university. Lisa is certainly going to be missed in her retirement. I'm also thrilled to announce that Alvin Lomibau, our assistant director of undergraduate programs for the past six years, has been selected as our new assistant dean. Alvin's experience, his thoughtfulness, his analytic eye, and his sincere desire to help both students and colleagues, as well as his background as a biomedical engineering alum of our school, make him an excellent assistant dean. I'm looking forward to working with Alvin and taking Hagem School advising initiatives and programs to the next level. In order to ensure that Lisa's legacy will live on for generations to come, we have created the Lisa Norwood Student Endowment Fund, which will support student enrichment, travel to conferences and student groups. To learn more, to share a memory with Lisa or to contribute to the fund, please check out this week's Hagem highlights or contact Tyrone Jimison, who's the Executive Director of Advancement for the Hagem School. We had another leadership, leadership transition in the Hagem School this year that I wanna share with you. After serving as Director of the Institute of Optics for several years, Scott Carney has stepped down to take on the position of Chief Scientific and Technology Officer at Optica, 
formerly the OSA. Scott accomplished much during his term as director, including enhancing the undergraduate and graduate academic programs, introducing a new online master's degree program, expanding the research mission of the Institute, growing the industrial associates program and developing many connections with alumni. We are all grateful to Scott for his dedication to the Institute and for his work to make the Institute ever better. And we wish him well in his new role. Tom Brown has been serving as interim director since July. An OSA fellow and Mercer Brugler professor, Tom is uniquely positioned to lead the Institute forward and capitalize on the many opportunities facing the Institute in research and education. Tom has already taken on many such initiatives, including leading a very successful fall industrial associates meeting and being awarded a graduate assistance in areas of national need or GAN grant to support PhD students in optics. Not to mention Tom is leading several large proposals the university is putting forth this fall. I thank Tom sincerely for taking on this leadership role and look forward to continuing to work with him to capitalize on the many opportunities ahead for the Institute. While COVID put a pause on much of the hiring we do in a typical year, we are thrilled that we were able to hire four outstanding new faculty members and I'd like to introduce them to you now. Pablo Aitor Postigo is joining the Institute of Optics as a professor. Pablo brings expertise in the design, fabrication, and characterization of new nanophotonic devices, which ties in nicely with our ongoing research in this exciting field. Chante Kalisken is joining us as assistant professor of instruction at the Gergen Institute for Data Science. Chante has taught introductory and advanced data science courses on machine learning, data visualization, and social and ethical aspects of data science. Kaveh Hosseini has joined the Department of Computer Science as an assistant professor, coming to us from a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University. Kaveh's research is in the area of theoretical computer science and deals with pseudo-random objects, which he uses to better understand a variety of questions across areas including computation, data storage, and distributed computing. And finally, last but certainly not least is Susanna Marcos, who joins us as the new David R. Williams, director of the Center for Visual Science and the inaugural holder of the Nicholas George Professorship at the Institute of Optics, along with a joint appointment in ophthalmology. Susanna is an internationally recognized expert in the optics of the eye and the interactions of light with the retina. She is a worthy successor to David Williams, who has directed the Center for Visual Science for three decades and can now devote full time to his pioneering research in adaptive optics. Susanna has already spearheaded a number of collaborations and grants across HAGEM, Arts and Sciences, and the School of Medicine and Dentistry, as well as with industry. And we certainly look forward to seeing where she takes CVS in the years ahead. I'm also excited to welcome Chris Dini, who became Deputy Director at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics on August 30th. Chris previously served as Chief Science and Technology Officer at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, in addition to his years of experience at the Nevada National Security Site, the US Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, or NNSA, and Sandia National Laboratories. Chris is known as a scientific and innovation leader with direct experience running complex operations. In addition, he has an insider's knowledge of the federal system, which oversees the LLE funding. And in other news, groundbreaking research related to the LLE, a burst of energy that lasted 100 trillionths of a second has reverberated far and near. A fusion experiment at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Labor Laboratory generated more than 10 quadrillion watts of fusion power. This brought scientists to the threshold of achieving their 40-year quest to achieve nuclear fusion in a laboratory. And it validated the laser-driven implosion techniques that Lawrence Livermore and our own laser lab have closely collaborated on as a way to assess the viability of the nation's nuclear weapons stockpile and perhaps even pave the way for an abundant supply of clean energy. Stay tuned for more exciting developments I am sure will be coming in the space in the weeks, the months and the years ahead. There are a number of impressive new research results from faculty in the Hagem School I wanna share with all of you. For example, what do you get when you imprint freeform optics with a nanophotonic metasurface? A new technology called metaform surfaces. 
Janique Rowland, the Brian J. Thompson Professor of Optical Engineering and Director of our Center for Freeform Optics, and Nick Vamivekas, Professor of Quantum Optics and Quantum Physics and the ASNE Dean of Graduate Education and Postdoctoral Affairs, have created a new design for augmented and virtual reality glasses using these metaform surfaces that are compact and easy to wear, delivering high quality imagery with socially acceptable optics that don't look like bug eyes. Their device is able to, to defy the conventional laws of reflection, gathering the visible light rays entering an AR VR eyepiece from all directions and redirecting them directly into the human eye. So you can see in this picture an image of what these glasses might look like and how different they look than existing AR VR glasses. Another exciting advance in optics comes from the lab of Will Renninger, who created the first demonstration of a highly chirped pulses created by using a spectral filter in a care resonator, which is a type of simple optical cavity that operates without amplification. The new technique works even with relatively low quality and inexpensive equipment and could pave the way for better high capacity telecommunication systems, improved astrophysical calibrations used to find exoplanets, and even more accurate atomic clocks and precise devices for measuring chemical containments in the atmosphere. So many uses for this new technology. This work is also related to the approach used by Nobel laureates Donna Strickland and Gerard Moreau, who helped usher in a revolution in the use of laser technology when they pioneered chirped pulse amplification while doing research at the University of Rochester. Ranga Diaz, an assistant professor of mechanical engineering, has recently set new benchmarks in the quest for room temperature superconducting materials. He and his collaborators at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, provided yet another example of surprising ways materials respond under extreme pressure. They have found that as the pressure increases when a squishy compound of manganese and sulfide is compressed in a diamond anvil, the material remarkably transitions into a metallic state and then back again into an insulator. Another example of impactful research being done in the Hagen School relates to climate change, which we know is a real issue society needs to address. Ocean currents propelled by kinetic energy from the wind are the greatest moderators of our climate. By transferring heat from the equator to polar regions, they help make our planet habitable. And yet the large scale models used by scientists to study this complex system fail to accurately account for the impact of wind on the ocean's most energetic components, swirling mesoscale eddies. Hussein Alui, Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering and collaborators at Los Alamos National Laboratory describe how the wind which propels larger currents has the opposite effect on eddies less than 260 kilometers in size. This results in a phenomena called eddy killing. The researchers for the first time were able to directly measure the overall impact of eddy killing, a continual loss of 50 gigawatts of kinetic energy from the ocean's currents. By applying a coarse-grained approach to satellite imagery, the researchers were able to separate the complex multi-scale structures of ocean currents and eddies embedded within each other. The method will hopefully be adapted by oceanographers to further explore other factors that may influence eddy killing and the role these eddies play in other aspects of the ocean circulation, heat flow, salt concentrations, and upwelling of nutrients and marine organisms. Essen Hoke, Associate Professor of Computer Science, and his students in the Rochester Human Computer Interaction Lab have been doing exciting work with palliative care expert Ronald Epstein, an oncologist at the Medical Center, to per perfect SOFI, the standardized online patient for healthcare interaction education. SOFI is an online virtual patient that helps physicians practice how to communicate effectively with late stage cancer patients about their disease and could have a major impact on improving the conversations that matter most for late stage cancer patients and their families. As a creative example of making the most of a less than ideal situation, while COVID-19 created downtime for her research lab last year, Astrid Mueller, assistant professor of chemical engineering, asked three of her PhD students to do a thorough literature search for information about the pulsed lasers and liquids technique the students would be using in her lab. They reviewed nearly 600 previous papers, resulting in the lab's own paper published in chemistry reviews that provides the most comprehensive up-to-date survey of the technology 
and it has been getting lots of attention, more than 3,000 downloads since its publication on June 2nd. Directing a pulsed laser at a solid material immersed in liquid creates nanoparticles with remarkably uniform properties that can be easily fine-tuned by adjusting the laser pulses and the chemical compositions of the solid and the surrounding fluid. Whole arrays of these carefully tuned nanoparticles can be prepared in a week and then compared and tested for use as catalysts far more quickly than would be required with traditional wet lab techniques. Chemical catalysts are the change agents behind the production of just about everything we use in our daily lives. So a technology that can speed up the process of finding catalysts and new applications is of crucial importance, especially in addressing pressing challenges in sustainability and green energy, which is the focus of the Mueller lab. As the James Webb Space Telescope heads towards its launch date, which is hopefully gonna be in December, dozens of Hagem School faculty and alumni who have contributed to the project will be among those awaiting images from 13.5 billion years ago when galaxies and stars were first being formed. Key contributors to the Webb Telescope include Duncan Moore, the Rudolph and Hilda Kingslake Professor in Optical Engineering Science, who served as co-chair of the Webb Telescope Optical Product Integrity Team to help ensure that no shortcuts were taken. Institute alum Jim Wyatt was the other co-chair. Jim Fina, the Robert E. Hopkins Professor of Optics, later joined Moore on the panel. Jim and his talented team of PhD students developed the phase retrieval algorithms that can be used to finely tune the 18 hexagonal mirrors of the web when they deploy nearly 1 million miles from Earth. Lee Feinberg, class of 87 from optics, has served in one of the most important leadership roles, overseeing the overall development of the telescope. Institute alum Joe Howard is the lead optical designer. And Larissa Siobhan Densmore, who is a mechanical engineering alum, directed mechanical space products and manufacturing at Northrop Grumman, the prime contractor for the web project. And the list goes on and on. In total, there is an incredible 43 faculty, students, and alumni from the Institute of Optics alone who have contributed to Webb. This is a remarkable tribute to the Institute community. As you can see, there is a lot of impressive research going on in the Hagem School and throughout the university. However, we are always looking as to what comes next and pushing forward to become ever better. In this spirit, the university is currently in the listening and learning stages to develop our next strategic plan. This plan will focus on five identified priorities to build a comprehensive strategy for the institution. The five priorities include leading through research and scholarship, reimagining education, building healthier lives, connecting with the community, cultivating an inclusive climate. These priorities will be our pathways as we guide the university into areas of innovation, wellness, and academic excellence. As we move forward, we will identify initiatives and success measures that will define how we reach and exceed the goals of the strategic plan. The university is seeking input from all stakeholders through focus groups and an online portal. I encourage all of you who have ideas on any of these different areas that we're thinking through to reach out and share them. You're also welcome to email me directly with your thoughts and ideas and I will ensure that they reach the right working groups. I'll share more about the Hagem specific plans and the university planning in the spring. As we return to our beloved campus, we have some new spaces to come back to. Our university's much anticipated Studio X is now online, providing a great place for our students, faculty and staff to experience, explore and experiment with the technology of extended reality. As the hub for extended reality at the University of Rochester, Studio X fosters a community of cross-disciplinary collaboration, exploration, and peer-to-peer -peer learning that lowers barriers, barriers to entry, inspires experimentation, and drives innovative research and teaching in immersive technologies. If you haven't had a chance to go see this space, I encourage you to check it out. It's located in the lower level of Carlson Library, and you can see what an amazing looking space this is. It's filled constantly with students exploring extended reality, uh, learning about it, implementing new techniques, teaching and learning. 
even better, don't just go explore the space, but try your hand at some XR technologies. There are lots of workshops available. Undergraduate research is a hallmark of our university and something that I think is incredibly important for our students to experience as part of their education. National Science Foundation, REU, research experiences for undergrad programs. These are a great way to bring students from other universities to come to our campus to do hands-on research with our faculty members and graduate students, along with our own undergraduate students. And one of the goals of an REU program is our hope to entice students who come for REUs to return here for their own graduate studies. Adding to our existing REUs in nano, bio, and quantum photonics, as well as another one in computational methods for understanding music, media, and the mind, is a new REU in imaging in medicine and biology for underrepresented minorities. Congratulations to PI Marvin Doily, professor and chair of electrical and computer engineering, and co-PI Jebo Luo, professor of computer science, who recently received NSF approval for this three-year REU program starting next summer. I'm excited about this new REU because it highlights a signature area of research strength at our university in imaging. It also demonstrates the unique research collaborations that are possible here because of the close proximity of our medical center to the River Campus. So this REU is going to involve faculty, not just from the Hagem School uh, and Arts and Sciences, but also from the School of Medicine and Dentistry and from our Gergen Institute for Data Science. And finally, this REU helps us address a key priority of our school and university to create a more diverse student body and learning environment. One of the things I am most proud of at the Hagem School is our students. And I'd like to highlight a few of them so you can understand why. Claire Wilson graduated last spring, class of 21, from chemical engineering, and she certainly made the most of her undergraduate experience at the University of Rochester. As a sophomore, Claire started participating in club water polo, despite no previous experience, and she joined the computational fluid dynamics research group of David Foster, associate professor of chemical engineering. In both instances, she said she was welcomed to close-knit groups that gave her opportunities to make new friends and learn from supportive peers. Elected to both Tau Beta Pi and Phi Beta Kappa Honor Societies as a junior, Claire also received a number of academic awards for her achievements. Tracy Moiston, class of 22, a senior BME major, is doing cutting edge research in the lab of Danielle Benoit, professor of biomedical engineering and director of the material science program. Tracy is also developing entrepreneurial skills and gaining self-confidence through internships and extracurricular activities. For example, she had never danced in her life until her DeLion peer advisor suggested she join a student dance team. And now she confidently, confidently performs with the team in front of very large crowds. Tracy, who is also a Tau Beta Pi honor student, says she is leaning towards working in industry but is also considering staying in academia. Wherever she ends up, she wants to be a source of encouragement for younger students, someone they can look up to. And I am certain she is going to accomplish this goal. When Alyssa Ho, who graduated last spring, gazed up at star-filled night skies while growing up in Denver, she developed a deep interest in space and also in sustainability as a way to help ensure those skies remain clear. Her experiences at our university and at our Institute of Optics helped her figure out which of those two paths to pursue as a career. After graduation, the optical engineering major and president of the 2021 class council headed to California to work on space system projects with Raytheon Intelligence and Space. And finally, Onjen Ogi Boshik's dream job is to one day design a Formula One race car. In pursuit of that dream, the mechanical engineering senior has been unswerving in his desire to find useful applications for what he learns in his classes. Starting his first year, for example, he was selected by his Baja teammates to be the frame project team lead and is serving as chief engineer as a senior this year. By sophomore year, Ogi was also doing research in Nayez Abdelrahim's lab in mechanical engineering. Ogi has received a number of awards in recognition of his contributions and his academic scholarship. These are just four examples of the amazing students we have at the Hagem School who inspire us with their dedication, drive, creativity, and desire to make the world a better place for all of us. So what happens to our amazing students when they leave Rochester? Well, they become alums who continue to make us proud. 
Here are a few examples of some of the incredible things our alums are doing and how they are being recognized. Optics alumna Christina Canavasi, the co-founder and president of Lytop Tech, a company that creates innovative optical instruments for non-invasive imaging in medicine and industry, has been named one of 50 inspiring women in Italy by Accelerator. Electrical engineering alumnus John McNeil has been named the Bernard M. Gordon Dean of Engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Alum Scott Pomerantz, who is also a member of our Dean's Advisory Committee, has been named CEO of Focal Point, a company that develops new technologies to transform the capability of global navigation satellite systems worldwide. Computer science alum Amanda Stent has been named the inaugural director of the Davis Institute for Artificial Intelligence at Colby College, one of the nation's oldest liberal arts colleges. And finally, our distinguished Institute of Optics alum, Jim, Jim Wyatt, received an honorary doctorate from the university. Jim, who is a professor emeritus and founding dean of the James C. Wyatt College of Optical Sciences at the University of Arizona, also serves on our dean's advisory committee and is a University of Rochester life trustee. We are very proud of all the contributions our alums continue to make every day. Events of the past year, both in Rochester and nationwide, remind us that racial bias and social injustice not only persist in our society, but have gained an alarming level of acceptance. As a university and as a school, we cannot afford to ignore this issue. In collaboration with the Kern Center for Leadership and Development in Arts Sciences and Engineering, we are taking steps at the school and department levels to address these issues. These steps include efforts to increase the diversity of our student body, our staff, and our faculty, enhance our efforts to attract and retain students from diverse backgrounds, and engage in efforts to address social injustice in our own community. As part of this initiative, we have been highlighting Hagem School faculty, alumni, and staff members, shown here, who serve as role models and who have contributed greatly to our efforts to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our departments have all been doing wonderful work in this area as well, including hosting panel sessions and seminars highlighting the contributions of underrepresented groups, creating DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion committees in the departments, examining their hiring and recruiting practices, and working to ensure a welcoming and inclusive culture for, for everyone who comes into our community. So big kudos to all the departments for their work in this space. Before I wrap up, I wanna share some data on the Hagen School. So this chart here shows our research expenditures uh, over the last 10 years, as well as our research awards that we've been granted over the past 10 years. As you can see, our expenditures remain strong and our awards are particularly strong this year. In addition to all of the regular uh, uh, funding that comes in, the regular research awards we get, notably this year, we received an NSF Physics Frontier Center, which is led by Rip Collins from Mechanical Engineering and the Laser Lab. Uh, this Physics Frontier Center is a multi-institution, large-scale research center that is going to look at uh, matter at extreme energy density, or IMAX, the Institute for Matter at Extreme Energy Density, which is an exciting new field of research that includes high energy density material science and physics, as well as interplanetary science. Our faculty have grown over the past decade, and while there have been some declines due to COVID hiring pauses, we are back to hiring this year and expect to be bringing in several new faculty next fall. If we look at the demographics of our faculty, uh, you can see we've continued to increase our percentages of both women and underrepresented minority faculty. While we still have a ways to go, these trends that we see for the percentages of our women faculty and our underrepresented minority faculty are all very positive. This plot shows our undergraduate enrollment trends by uh, department, you can see the individual department, the percentage uh, that they make up from our undergraduate student body. And you can see that our numbers have dropped off a bit due to COVID over the last two years, but we're holding steady around 1,750 students in the Hagem School. This year, Art Sciences and Engineering had a very strong admissions year with our largest class ever at 1,500 students. And so we expect these numbers will rise again in the coming years after we get through the uh, reductions that we saw because of COVID. 
And as you can see in the data here, computer science is still by far our biggest major. Almost a third of the students in the Hagen School are CS majors, followed by biomedical engineering. If we look at the demographics of our undergraduate student population, we see that we continue to uh, increase our percent of women, and we're almost at a third of the Hagem undergraduate students being women at this point. Uh, but we've remained flat in terms of our underrepresented minority students. And so these are two areas we continue to push on. Moving now to our numbers of students in our master's programs, we can see that it, once again, COVID had an impact and we have uh, dropped a little bit in terms of enrollments in our master's degrees. Uh, in particular, international students had a difficult time enrolling in 2020 and 2021 due to travel and other types of restrictions. And we expect those numbers will rise in the coming years. Our demographics for the master's students have remained relatively flat throughout the last 10 years. Again, this is an area we need to work on. And at the PhD level, you can see we've increased our PhD enrollments over the past about four or five years, um, holding steady around 400 PhD students across our departments in Hagem. And looking at the demographics, uh, again, we are fairly flat in terms of our percentages of women. We're about a quarter of our PhD population is women. Um, however, we have made good increases in terms of our percentage of underrepresented minority PhD students up to 7.6% this year. And finally, if we look at some numbers of, uh, regarding alumni engagement, um, in particular, we're very excited to see that our alumni participation rate has increased this year. Uh, this is an important metric for us because this counts as part of our rankings metric. And what this measures is how many of our alums give back something to the University of Rochester. It doesn't matter how much it's giving back, anything counts as participation. We'd love to get this number up closer to 20% and hope to engage even more alums in giving back in the coming year. So I wanna thank all of you who are alums out there, friends, donors who give to the Hagen School. We had a wonderful year in terms of giving uh, in support of the Hagem School. And I also wanna thank Tyrone Jimison and Derek Swanson for all of their efforts connecting with our alums. So in closing, I wanna highlight what a special community I think we have here at the Hagem School and at the University of Rochester. We have exceptional faculty, staff, and students. But what really inspires me is how much our community cares about each other and about making the world a better place. We came together to make it through the challenges presented by COVID, and we are still supporting each other through sometimes daily struggles. This is something for which I am both supremely proud and immensely grateful. So thank you to all of you who support and care and help the Hagen School. We could not be where we are without each and every one of you. And now I'm happy to take any questions you might have. And I'll invite Paul to come back on and join me. Everybody. So again, if you have questions, please put them in the, uh, the question at the bottom of the screen. I have a couple of questions submitted in advance. Um, Nicole asked about the efforts that the university is making to promote or elevate U of R's reputation beyond just the, uh, the upper, upstate New York area. Could you, could you comment on that? Yeah, there, there's a, a number of things that, um, that we're doing. First, um, I should say that our uh, admissions team um, is, is all over the world and they promote the U of R as a fantastic place for undergraduate studies um, across the country and across the world. So there's a lot of work going on to um, uh, recruit students from around the world. Our graduate um, uh, school, our GEPA, graduate, uh, our Office of Graduate Education and Postdoctoral Affairs also has work um, that they do to go out and recruit students and get the name and the word out about the University of Rochester. But I think one of the most effective uh, ways that we get our name out is through the impact that we have in the community and in the world through our research, through our scholarship, through our programs. And so things like um, I mentioned uh, Ranga Diaz's uh, room temperature superconducting uh, materials that he found. That was a groundbreaking research that 
got pressed throughout the world in all sorts of different kinds of media. Um, uh, new and innovative research results like that have real potential to, uh, to get our name out there and hopefully make us more of a household name. But there's a lot of work going on on the recruiting side, as well as again on communications and getting um, all of the great things that we do uh, out into the world. Thank you. I have another question here from, from Bennett. And this, I guess this um, ties a little bit into the, the innovative research we're doing. It's a question about monetizing sort of the inventions and the discoveries that are happening at the U of R and, and within the Hadrian School. Could you comment on the university's ability to, to, bring, uh, to bring resources in based on the discoveries that are being made? Absolutely. So we have a very strong um, organization here called UR Ventures. And actually, um, we brought in just recently a new head of UR Ventures, Harold Tolbert, who um, is coming to us from Penn State. Um, the whole goal of UR Ventures is to work with faculty to find what are those inventions that can be um, uh, that that have IP, that have intellectual property that can be protected. Uh, they help. Uh, they they run the process to get um, patents to submit for patents, um, uh, both in the US and uh, internationally. And UR Ventures is also the team that goes out and tries to license our technology. So they work with companies to license any of the IP that we have to companies that might be interested in um, uh, utilizing some of that technology, as well as uh, they, they work with faculty and with others um, on startup companies. So if faculty want to create a startup company around some of their technology, and I'd actually mentioned, I'll give you an example, um, Christina Canavasi, who I mentioned was um, uh, recognized as uh, one of the 50 top women in Italy for her startup company. That was started with Janique Roland, a faculty member here. Um, and Janique and Christina, who was her um, student, started this company together. UR Ventures can help um, faculty who want to start companies to um, uh, take their technologies and, and transfer that out into the, um, into the workplace, into the commercial uh, realm, UR Ventures is there to help with that. So we do have a fairly robust system in place to help monetize the inventions that we have and to help get, really get them out into uh, use, which is our ultimate goal. I have another question related, related to the, the inventions here. So this is a, a hot topic at the moment. Um, Jennifer is asking, how is the new normal uh, situation after the pandemic? How has that spurred innovation or um, creativity? Any, any insights into how that's changed things at the U of R or spurred things at the U of R? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't think we fully know the answer to that. I think um, it has allowed us to learn about new ways of doing things. So I think the fact that we can have this state of the school in a virtual format, I used to do this just for uh, a local audience here at Rochester. We would do it in person, um, but now we know that we can open up things like this to the broad community. Um, Advancement and alumni relations have doing, been doing a wonderful job of hosting a wide variety of programs that bring in alums from around the world. That's something we could have done before, but we didn't really know about. And the pandemic really uh, forced us all to learn and think about how do we do things in new and different ways. So what we're trying to balance is we are a residential campus. People wanna be on campus, they wanna be here, they want in-person activities and events, and we are doing those. And we, we think they're really important. We want in-person classes. But at the same time, there are opportunities created by everyone being comfortable using Zoom and knowing that we can have meetings on Zoom and knowing that we can have events like this on Zoom. That opens up a wide range of opportunities. So just to give you an example, I had mentioned that Departments are having colloquia speakers. Some are coming on the campus and some are coming via Zoom. Um, it's not easy to get to Rochester as, as everyone on this call knows. Um, you know, if you don't live in the Northeast, you gotta take a hop to get here. There's no direct flights. So it's a good day of travel here or day of travel back if you're coming from let's say California. So it's harder to get speakers who wanna commit to several days to visit the U of R versus a couple hours where they can be on Zoom and interacting with people. So I think there's a lot of opportunities um, for us and, and there's even opportunities within the educational space to think about things like flipped classrooms, things like uh, recorded lectures so students can watch them afterwards. What are the things that will help students learn better um, and while still preserving the um, social interactions and the importance of creating community that we all care about? Thank you, Mindy. Uh, I have a question from Holly, Holly uh, coming in who's asking about 
a student who maybe wants to major in computer science but hasn't had much significant pro programming experience before they come to college and how the Hagen School would handle that, that kind of situation. Yeah, we, we definitely have students who, who don't have a lot of experience. There's a whole range of introductory courses. And so students are um, given advisors. We have uh, three different advisors that Hagem School students get. They have their faculty advisor is one of their primary um, advisors to talk with about things like this. So they can talk to their faculty advisor about what's my experience, what are my goals, and the faculty member will work with them to figure out which class makes the most sense for them. There's also each program has an undergraduate coordinator who is a wealth of information. Uh, that's a, a staff member who works with our undergraduate students and helps get them in the right classes, helps connect them to the right professors to talk to and so forth. And then we also have college advisors who are uh, professional advisors um, who know about lots of different programs, not just the individual um, uh, computer science in this case, but the Hagem advisors the college advisors are able to work with students and point them as well in the right directions. So usually what we suggest is that students who are trying to struggle with where do I, where should I start? Where do I, um, uh, what classes should I register for? We have lots of advising support services that are in place to help students um, go through those questions. Okay, and I think we have one last question here. This is uh, coming from Joseph and he's asking, it's a fairly open question here, but um, could you comment on professional engineering licensure and more, more broadly on engineering ethics, how what we do with engineering ethics in the uh, agency. Good question. So um, ethics are an important uh, part of, of, of any engineering education is to understand uh, not just the things that are very obvious, but the gray areas. That's where the interesting um, discussion and study of ethics comes in. Um, most of our programs uh, weave discussion about ethics into individual courses. So when you're talking about, let's say, building bridges in a mechanical engineering class, you'll have discussions about uh, what are the ethical uh, considerations you need to take into account when you build bridges. In optics, um, you know, I, I had mentioned the Webb Space Telescope. We actually had, you know, our faculty and our alums are key in making sure that uh, the Webb Telescope is being done ethically, um, that decisions are being made that will support the development of this um, really important project in ways that, um, that, that make sense. So it's a really important part of the curriculum. Uh, we're actually, we have some classes that are specifically devoted to ethics. So there's a class on um, ethics and technology, and then there's another one about um, algorithms and data and ethics and data, because that's becoming a real issue with big data and with um, uh, data science and, and um, AI. And so there's a class that specifically deals with that topic. So uh, for students who are interested, you can actually do a cluster that has um, all sorts of uh, classes, a cluster of three classes um, in uh, the humanities in ethics that really delve deeply into some of these issues. And we encourage our students to take some of those as well. Thank you, Wendy. I think that's the end of our questions for today. So um, I don't know who's supposed to sign off here, but I, I want to, on behalf of the school, I want to thank you for, for uh, summarizing the state of the school for us all. Great. And thank you all for attending. Really appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. Take care, everyone. Bye.